I'll give you another story that I find quite amusing. Maybe you might not find quite funny. Um, so you can see I've got a struggle bit. You know, it doesn't connect. <laughs> a couple of whiskers, not marshmallow like, like you. And I remember I was reading when I was in Egypt about, um, I think it was one of Ghazali's books from the 15th century or another scholar from around that era. I think even like Joseph and Ghazali, one of the two. And in the in one of their books, they spoke about that it is not allowed for a man to sit next to an Amrat, like a, a beardless boy. Mm. I'm thinking, what does that mean? Because that a beardless boy is a fitna. Now, again, if you're reading that, not understanding the context, what was going on even at that time, you would think, okay, is does that mean that a lot of the men were attracted to um, boys? And that was an issue in some parts of the Muslim world in, in Iraq, in Baghdad. Mm. So much so that there were some Muslims, um, particularly some Sufis, who would say that, um, what they could another, that looking at a beardless boy is like drawing closer to Allah. I would have been like, or they were saying that um, some of them were so attracted to beards where they favoured boys over women as sexual partners. Wow. So much so that some of the scholars like Ajahim, they used to write in a satirical way the the preferences or why they why a, um, a womanizer prefers women and they, and he's argued with a sodomizer who prefers boys. And it, it was done in, a, in in an edutainment way. So mm. if you're just reading this on Facebook, you're thinking, what's going on? But yeah. that was a, a fitna that they were that they were dealing with at that time, especially they were asking about that. Well, like there was an obsession with a number of men that they were desiring young boys. Now, again, this is not Islamically, obviously, because we know this is not allowed. But this was an issue in the Muslim community, mm. and scholars were speaking about that. So, if you've got some men who found themselves attracted to young boys, I would say, if, in that particular situation, if you are of that, but maybe kind of avoid that fitna. Now, if you're reading this in the 21st century, not understanding the context, so you think then you might think, okay, it's haram to sit next to a beardless boy. And it's like, no, that again, the context. Likewise, when we speak about sexual practices, there were some fabricated hadiths that that said that looking at a woman's um, vulva, her private parts, will cause blindness, and that was fabricated and spread amongst the people in Iraq and Baghdad. Now, that's why you have a number of the scholars in Medina because they didn't. They don't come across these fabricated hadiths. When they'll ask the question is, am I allowed to look at a woman's private parts? And the, and the scholars will respond to that, of course you're allowed, you can even lick it. Mm. Now again, because they were responding to what was going, some of the issues that they were afflicted with. So I'm at my point in showing these different scholars speaking about different issues, whether it's pedestry, like boy, uh, man, boy love, whether it's looking at um, a woman's private parts, these were responses to issues that were going through, that they were facing in the community at that time. 100%. And even if you read the story of when Imam um, Abu Hanifa, rahimullah, when he met Imam Malik, rahimullah, and obviously Imam Abu Hanifa is about 13 years older than Imam Malik, but obviously they were like the same generation, both learned scholars, um, one from Iraq, the other one is from Medina. Their approach to even fit was very different. And they spoke about it in the interaction because because it was so remember Baghdad at that time in the eighth ninth century was a cosmopolitan society and they had influences from the Persians, from the from the ancient Indians, from the Greeks, different philosophers, and this was something that even a number of the scholars were reading. And you had people coming from these different traditions coming into Islam, and they had a lot of these questions: Is this allowed? Is that that the Arabs or the Arabs in the Medina weren't familiar with or weren't aware of? So that's why even in their books of fiqh, a lot of them, they will ask hypothetical questions. If such and such happened, what is the answer? What should someone do? If such and such, like, you know, because of it was a very changing environment. Yeah. Imam Malik, he didn't like that approach. He's like, don't ask him question if something hasn't happened. So you can see that he was a bit more, if it, don't ask, don't say like a hypothetical question. If a man um, is breastfed by such and such, does that mean, you know, all of these questions, has it actually happened? Yes or no? Person says, no, I'm not answering that question. Yeah, yeah. But when they met, and Abu Hanif was given his, uh, the reason why he had adopted that approach, because of the, the fit now and a lot of the issues that were going on in his, his time, Imam Malik understood that. So it was an appreciation and a respect. Although his approach was different, because again, he, what he was very different from the people of Imam Malik. 
and the people in Medina, and that's reflected in the fit. So yeah. even when speaking about the scholars that are speaking about erotology and sexual matters, because they're facing different things, because they are um, like about what was the other story about? Um, like scholars responded. I think it was in the um, Fatawa Hindia or another book around Iraq, where they used where those they were asking, is it allowed to have sex, um, intimate relations with your wife? Um, with the light on, because in some traditions they believe that the light should be off. And yeah. Some traditions said that even there should be a sheet between the man and the woman, and then there should just be a hole. So you've got some Muslims coming from these traditions coming into Islam, and again for them that's appropriate. That is um, considered to be modest, like that's the way you make love. So it's their understanding that's how we're going to continue doing it. So they, some of them were asking clarification from an Islamic perspective: is that can we can I make love to my wife with the light off? Do I need to have this sheet in between? And the same thing happened again during the time of the Prophet وسلم, when some of the men of Mecca married some of the women of Medina mm. and they wanted to engage in sexual intercourse, vaginal intercourse from from behind, not in the anus, but obviously in the vagina. And the women were like, No, we don't do that. Like, they refused. And then the men wanted clarification from the Prophet وسلم, whether it's permissible to engage in vaginal intercourse from behind. So again, these issues where the Quran has responded to some of these issues, where the Prophet has responded to some of these issues, even the scholar is of that time. So the same way, like, you know, and I read scholars that will say, oh, oral sex, that's only something that they do in the West or the Kufar. And it's just yeah. like, have you read some of the books that they're talking about in the 14th century and some of the antics that they were getting up to? You know, so again, it's to try and... I didn't want to just paint, oh, you know, Islamic history is just wonderful. There are no issues. So people need to see the diversity in some of the issues that people are facing. So a lot of what even is going on now is not new. The only new phenomenon is maybe like you could say um, the technological aspects in terms of the access to like porn and stuff like that. But in terms of like sexual issues that or people that are struggling with, whether married, not married, it's not nothing, it's not nothing new. And I, and I just think that sometimes a lot of Muslims need to kind of get out of this um, idealistic um, idea, you know, that, that in the past it was great and then unfortunately, you know, we got, you know, it's just, again, I, if you read history, it's very clear, like, again, things happen and again, you're dealing with human beings. It doesn't make someone less of a Muslim or less of a human being because they may be going through certain things or so they have these um, struggles. So, sorry, I think I kind of went off on a tangent, but... No, no, um, it, was, it was fascinating to listen to that and I completely agree. I think, I think one of the main issues here is that what you what you've got now is because of globalization you've got a mix of cultures and now especially with muslims in the west who you know it was our parents or our grandparents that came to this country wherever you are whether america or, or the uk or australia or wherever and of course they back, brought back their sensibilities with them and then their kids grew up in um you know the west and they picked up Western ses sensibilities. So, for example, a, a lot of Western Muslims, they, for them, it is, you know, the idea of oral sex and, you know, how they engage in intimacy is, is, is very clear because of the Western sensibilities. But then when come their wedding night or a few weeks before their wedding, the bride or the groom-to-be will be told by their parents, oh, you're not allowed to do this, you're not allowed to do that, can't do this and you can't do that. And then suddenly it becomes a shock factor where they're like, oh, does Islam not let me do all of these things? And, and the culture and the Islamic aspect gets confused. And that's why a lot of Muslims need that education where they need to differentiate, okay, what is actually the Shari'i guideline? What, what will I be punished for if I do this? And what is permissible and good that I, I can engage in? And that's really where I feel a lot of Muslims are trying to get that understanding when it comes to this stuff, because I used to do presenting on an Islamic channel, um, on Iman channel, and uh, one of the key questions that you would always get in the nighttime show would always be related to like what is permissible um, in terms of sexual activity. And if you just put this into YouTube or Google search and like actually look at the analytics of how often this kind of stuff is shared, uh, how often this stuff is searched, um, 
you'll be surprised like is oral sex halal is like probably like one of the yeah. top searches on like youtube i, I wouldn't be surprised um so it, i do feel like it's one of those things that education is the key here and to really access the islamic tradition sure like lots of scholars had lots of opinions but when it goes back to showcasing the di uh, diversity i think that's really important and i think you've done that excellently in your book